Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the next unit of module 5, where we look at the narration of the nation. We took a look at how the nation was formed through the uh, script and the role that the script played in the imagining of the nation and also the fragmentation of undivided India. Now we look at the narration of the nation taking forward uh, the idea proposed by R Frederick Jameson as well as uh, Benedict Allison about the role of fiction and newspapers and printing in the production of, in the imagining of the nation and Jameson's idea of all third world novels as allegories of the nation. We might dis disagree with Jameson's contention as I just Ahmed has done, but let's first look at the role that the nation played in the imagining of the nation. So I'm going to take up uh, this, uh, in this unit, I'm going to take up uh, two arguments, the two, uh, two aspects of the nation. The first, I would look at how the nation was narrated by the, by, by imagined by fiction. So the fiction becomes complicit in the narration of the nation. And then I would move on to how uh, somewhere in the 80s, the, uh, or even earlier, as I have uh, shown in the other unit, how the cracks in the nation began to appear and the idea of the nation came to be interrogated by, again, within the pages of fiction. Let us look at the idea of the master narrative of the nation and the founding fathers who scripted this master narrative of the nation, namely Raja Ram Mohan Roy writers like Rabindranath Tagore, writers like Bankim Chandru, Charaji. And of course, we do not need an introduction to the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and the dream of the modern Indian nation, Jawaharlal Nehru, and his idea of a secular, democratic nation. What, what is important for us is how the novel becomes complicit in this imagining of the nation and the imagined community of the nation. And the role that uh, ideologues such as Bharatendu uh, Harish Chandra and novelists like uh, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee along with novelists writing in other languages in the other Indian bhashas became implicated in the imagining of this, this narrative of the nation. Uh, new research such as Romina Sethi's book Myths of the Nation has shown how uh, the construction of uh, the it focuses on the construction of forms of historical consciousness in narratives or school of narrative and she shows how what goes behind the writing of true and authentic histories by treating historical fiction as a literary dimension of nationalist ideology. So what what we are interested in is how this Nehruvian ideology how the nationalist ideology is reflected in fiction and her book traces nationalism from its abstract underpinnings to its concrete manifestation in historical fiction which underwrites the Indian freedom struggle and more new work like Kittel's work on the novel of the 20s and the 30s shows how the representation of proto-national identity in Indian English fiction before the formative nationalist novels of the 1920s and 30s. It shows the connections between Indian English fiction and the secular, secularism of the Nehruvian national project. So this is our concern how the secular Nehruvian project is translated in the writings of the 1920s and 30s and even earlier as this book shows. As he shows that primordialist nationalism and culturally transacted concepts of communal racial identity were key elements 
in the political imagining of early Indian fiction in English, taking up the works of Sharad Kumar Ghosh's um, The Prince of Destiny and S. M. Mitra's Hindupur. More recently, Ulka Anjaria's work shows that there was nothing inherently unified about the diverse cultures, religions, languages that comprise the Indian subcontinent under colonialism. So what she points out is that this brief was uh, the idea of European model of nationalism, which took for granted the existence of one religion, one language or one ethnicity was doomed to fa failure. And for this reason, British argued that India was not fit to rule itself. And she shows that uh, this idea on, on behalf of this sense of identity that beginning in the 19th century, Indian writers of literature, not just Indian writers in English, but Indian writers of literature began to imagine cultural unity through their fictional and poetic works. By the 20s and 30s, literature had come to occupy a central role in the Indian nationalist movement. So we are looking in literature, particularly novel, as the site for the uh, imagining as well as the mobilization of this idea of, a, of the unity of the nation or even the idea of the nation. And this intersection of politics and fiction in the process of national formation in Indian English Indian fiction during the 20th century, she looks at that and does this by explaining the position of the writer in the process of decolonization. The central pro question of this project, as she puts it, is the construction of fiction of political developments during the processes of national formation in India and how an English Indian novelist reflects upon these issues. So the active involvement of the Indi English Indian writer in this imagining or in the scripting of the master narrative of the nation. And again, Rosemary George's new work uh, shows that during the, and she uh, shows uh, direct complicity and the involvement of the writers in the nationalist project and uh, shows that uh, the writers were given the brief to uh, create this image of a unified, seemingly caste-free modernize India for consumption both at home. So during the 20th century, at the height of the independence movement and after, Indian literary writing in English, according to her, was given the, specifically given the brief, was entrusted with the task of consolidating the image of a unified, seemingly caste-free modernizing India. And this led to a critical insistence on the proximity of the national and the literary, which in turn led to the canonization of certain writers and themes and the dismissal of others. The painstaking efforts that went into the elaboration of a national literature in English for independent India, uh, she focuses on that. And another new study looks at how the Mahatma misunderstood demonstrates so it complicates the story of the involvement or implication of the writers in Indian languages or bhashas as well as English in the nationalist projects by showing that uh, the nationalist fiction by extension the nationalist political movement was marked from the beginning by a deep ambivalence about the relevance of nationalist agitation and mainstream nationalist politics for minorities in colonial India and sought to recast anti-colonial politics through novelistic debates with the spokesman for Indian nationalism, namely Mohandas Karamchan Gandhi. Now we look at, quickly look at, take a look at some of these novelists who uh, gave their consent to the master narrative of the nation and helped to script that master narrative. We begin with Pankin Chandra Chattopadhyay, who is considered the father of the Indian novel and as one of the most important Indian political novelists of the anti-colonial era. His book, Anand Math, is considered a foundational text for the understanding of Indian nationalism and the hymn Bande Mataram, Hail Mother, in Anand Math became the unofficial anthem 
during the partition of Bengal in 1905 and in the ensuing struggle for independence from British rule. It is in Anand Math that the first national imagining of the nation as mother in Indian fiction which became naturalized in all narrative genres began. Uh, now I quickly take a look at three, uh, three novelists, the first generation of Indian novelists in English, uh, the, the triumvirate or the troika who, uh, whose writing is often cited as, uh, as central to the imagining of the nation through their direct involvement in the nationalist movement or direct indirect engagement with the idea of the nation in the writings. And the most, um, uh, now most of uh, these, uh, the, the three novelists, they were not only influential in their own lifetime, but uh, they all lived up well into the lived well into the 90s and had a very important role in the shaping of the idea of Indian fiction in English. Um, so this idea of I will not have time to go into their individual oeuvre and the uh, you know dwell on the aesthetic merit of their work, but I would mainly focus on how this. Uh, the, these three writers along with um, the writers in Hindi like Prem Chandra and Bengali like Bankit Chandra Chatterjee constitute that generation of writers that we, who we call the nationalist generation who had, who, would, who, who, who played a key role in scripting or narrating the idea of the nation and their novels were uh, appropriated by the nationalist movement in s to a certain extent uh, through this idea to the can to the formation of the canon of Indian literature to show how the novel becomes import Im involved implic implicitly involved in the imagining of the nation. I, uh, the, I'm, uh, I'll quickly run through these slides to show you that their own personal histories were very diverse. Mulkraj Anand, as you can see through his biography, was uh, born in North India and Punjab and lived in several place, places, went uh, to England, was educated where he encountered European ideas and history and yet uh, it was in his school years that he was, teenage years, that he was introduced to nationalist political activity, to non-violent campaigning and to imprisonment inspired initially by a talk given at the college by the activist. Annie Besson. Now, uh, his novels, most of his novels, t look at or uh, narrate the nation from the perspective of the subaltern. His characters are all working class. Uh, Kuli, uh, in the novel Kuli, in Untouchable, we have a, a, a Dalit character who is the protagonist of the novel and a soldier in Across the Black Waters. So, in uh, these novels, it's uh, there is of course a, a dissonance between his own upper class uh, or middle class location and his uh, uh, political commitment to narrate the nation from the perspective of the nation, uh, from the perspective of the subaltern, and the subaltern becomes his instrument, his means to critique the master narrative of the nation dominated by the upper class, upper caste uh, uh, male uh, uh, belonging, uh, the male elite. So uh, within, even as the nation is narrated in his novels, it also comes under a critique because he looks at it, however uh, faulty his understandings of the subaltern might be uh, due to his own uh, elite location. His sympathies with the subaltern and his desire, his intention to look at the nation from the perspective of the subaltern uh, helps him to deconstruct the nation and to look at it from the, from the subaltern perspective, from the lens of the subaltern and how the nation impacts the subaltern. In R.K. Narayan, we have a very different biography and a movement to a very different region to the south and who has been uh, raised in uh, Chennai uh, and then is uh, educated, uh, the son of a school teacher who uh, had his loyalties to the British and uh, in spite of his uh, comparative uh, non-involvement, direct non-involvement in the political movement, his novels are a testimony 
to his uh, engagement with the idea of the nation from the perspective of the south of India or uh, which is often seen as a microcosm of uh, his town of Malguri who all we all have uh, grown up uh, reading about or watching on television. The town is often seen as a microcosm of the nation and how uh, uh, looking at the nation from this small region or this small town in South India, he, uh, uh, he uh, creates a community, he creates a town, he creates a space which is emblematic of the nation and looks at it from the point of view of the middle class. So there's a difference in the class and caste locations uh, of Narayan and Anand and then we move to the third novelist in his, in his novel The Waiting for the Mahatma is one of the novels we, where he directly engages with the Gandhian ideology not uncritically and then we move on to Raja Rao, the third one, the third writer in the time were eight, whose novel Kantapura is seen as a very influential text, which deals directly with the civil disobedience movement of 1930s with the Karnataka village as its location, where a formally educated young man motivates the village with instances of failure and fulfillment, acceleration and exa exasperation. So during this time, many activists and intellectuals came into the mainstream of national activity. They were not identified by a homogeneity of interests or grounded in any common theory of nationalism. The absence of common ground became one of the primary reasons for importing Western nationalism into India. Uh, now having looked at the idea of the nation as a narration, uh, of uh, sorry not the nation as a narration but the narration of the nation or the scripting of the nation by the first generation of writers uh, in India uh, writers both from bhashas and from uh, writing in English we move on to how the nation is interrogated in another unit we would be looking at how the nation is interrogated or deconstructed from the perspective of um, those voices of the nation which were marginalized in the construction of the nation. But uh, in this particular unit, we would look at within Indian English, within the corpus of Indian English novel, we find a moment in this history when the idea of the nation is interrogated and the idea that nation is not real. So the first questioning of the nation, the first interrogation of the idea of the nation, which today we say is being questioned in the era of globalization, as we hear about the demise of the nation state, impending demise of the nation state, and doubts are being cast about the validity or the relevance of the nation. Uh, in the face of the new, in view of the new borderless world that we inhabit, we need to go back to this moment in literary history when the idea of the nation was first interrogated uh, in the uh, in the so-called uh, uh, when when these voices of those who interrogated the idea of the nation were still not very voluble with the critics of the nation or the, those who question the nations were not very vocal. So this interrogation of the idea of the nation first came from a novelist who was uh, of Indian origin, who claimed to be of Indian origin, but who did not live in India, and how the nation became implicated in the new discourse on migra migrancy, hybridity, and post-colonialism about the need, need to imagine the nation beyond its boundaries to include the diaspora and uh, the diasporic writer. So this critique which came from a diasporic writer of uh, who claimed India as his or origin but uh, uh, interrogated the idea of a Hindu uh, nation and a Hindu a idea by writing the nation from the perspective of a Muslim writer and from, a, from the idea of a Muslim protagonist to show the cross fertilization of Hindu, Muslim, Sanskritic and Persian Arabic uh, identities in the, form, in the 
uh, in the original imagining of undivided India and how these imaginings persisted at the everyday level even after independence and how these boundaries were destroyed to the to the idea of the myth of the nation to the idea of the uh, boundaries of the nation and I quote from the novel that I'm talking about is uh, the novelist that I'm talking about is Salman Rushdie who doesn't need an introduction but those of you who are not familiar with him uh, to the details of his life I must tell you that he's a British Indian he's uh, he's considered a bit British Indian novelist and essays who now lives in New York and his it was his second novel Midnight's Children 1981 published in 1981 which won the Booker Prize in 1981 and won the Booker of Bookers later now Salman Rushdie in his person as well as in writing problematizes the idea of the nation problematizes the idea of national identities because as a person who was born in India who lives uh, who, whose nationality is British who now lives in New York he forces us his writing as well as in his person he compels us to rethink the idea of the na nation and national identity or the uh, it f compels us to imagine uh, to Im uh, compels us to imagine the boundaries of the nation beyond the geographical territories of the nation to to span the diasporas to span the borders of the nation to include uh, imagined communities of the nation which do not inhabit the boundaries of the nation but identify culturally um, uh, or uh, linguistically or in, uh, uh, empathize with the idea of the nation so it leads us to question the idea of national identity itself his work is uh, combines magic realism with historical fiction and is concerned with the many connections disruptions and migrations between eastern and western civilizations uh, so in his person and in his writing he contests the idea of national literatures and the nation which is interrogated through the publication of Midnight's Children in 1981 Salman Rushdie himself is a migrant who dwells in travel. He's born in Mumbai in 1947, left India to join school in, in England as a teenager while his parents migrated to Pakistan. Now he lives in New York. So the question we need to ask is where does Rushdie belong? To India, to Pakistan, to the UK, or to the US? He is often claimed as Indian and claims India as his past. So uh, I will not have the I will not have the time to go into uh, Salman Rushdie has uh, ha as uh, the poster boy of the media. I would not have time to go into how he is seen as embodying the ethic of uh, migrancy and hybridity on uh, which in in the formulation of uh, the now. Um, quite uh, jaded theory of post-colonialism or post-modernism I would not have time to go into that what I would like to look at is how this interrogation of the idea of the movement it comes a from a writer who is not uh, uh, who, whose nationality is not Indian B who's, uh, who, who doesn't belong to the core uh, group who constituted or formed the idea of the nation and uh, see uh, the idea of this interrogation of the nation comes well uh, much earlier than the late 80s when uh, globalization is technically believed to have begun it started with uh, we can look at the publication of midnight's children as that inaugural moment which begin which in, which initiates the discussion or debate on on the idea of the nation uh, and in it's the first time or uh, maybe um, a repetition of a history where a na where a novel becomes the site for the emerging debate within India on the idea of the nation and what does India signify where the novel becomes the uh, starting point for these discussions on the fate of the nation 
debates which begin much before the onset of globalization. So, uh, this idea of the interrogation of the notion of nation state as a given entity and the idea that the nation was a myth, a narrative produced by consensus is first articulated aesthetically in, the, in, uh, in, in a fiction by Salman Rushdie and since uh, this, uh, there's no better way to talk about it than to quote from the novel itself, I take the liberty of quoting from Midnight's Children which succinctly summarize what Rushdie means by the idea of the nation or how, how, what, wh how he critiques the nation. So he says that there's, he's talking about 15th August 1947 and he says there was an extra festival on the calendar, a new myth to celebrate because a nation which had never been, never previously existed was about to win its freedom, catapulting us into a world which although it had 5,000 years of history, although it had invented the game of chess and traded with Middle Kingdom Egypt was nevertheless quite imaginary into a mythical land, a country which would never exist except by the efforts of a phenomenal collective will, except in a dream we all agreed to dream, a collective fiction in which anything was possible, a fable rivaled only by two other mighty fantasies, money and God. So this idea of the nation as imagined, the nation as a myth, as a story, as a dream which existed only through collective imagining, which existed only, which came into being only through consensus by of a group of people or of a collectivity. That idea was best illustrated or elucidated in by Salman Rushdie in Midnight's Children, which was later formalized by Anderson in his now famous book, Imagine Communities. Now let's look at how Rushdie, uh, uh, who uh, inaugurates this movement of uh, the uh, movement from the nation to globalization by questioning the idea of the nation, by interrogating the idea of the nation, he also becomes, presages the movement towards globalization. In his inaugural lecture, Tanner lectured at Yale in 2002, uh, Rushdie reflected on how frontiers and borders shape us, trying to confine us and yet lure us to cross. The first, first frontier, he said then, was the edge of the water, where at some point a living thing came up from the ocean and crossed the boundary and found that it could breathe outside water unlike the countless others who had perished gasping for breath. So this questioning and interrogation of boundaries, borders and frontiers which confine us, particularly those of nation states, Rushdie talks about free flows, uh, the idea of free flowing movements. And so what I'm trying to say is that Rushdie stands at the cusp of uh, he, he, uh, the, the, the in-between sta state when as we are transiting from the era of nationalism to the era of glo globalization, Rushdie in his person through his own in-betweenness and his um, standing on the interstices of the nation and globalization presages both, uh, um, uh, declares the death of the nation and also presages the movement towards globalization. So Rushdie continues, there were just fish who, were, who by chance learn how to crawl and so in a way are we. It's the same drive, he adds, that made Columbus's ships head for the edge of the world or the pioneers take to their covered wagons. The image of Armstrong taking his first moonwalk echoes the first movements of life on earth in our deepest natures, natures. we are frontier crossing beings. So it's Rushdie first who talks about the presence of contact zones who challenges the idea of insularity and talks about the presence of contact zones as the boundary crossing impulse as more natural to human beings than, than the boundaries which he sees are political and which are artificially constructed. 
And once that step is taken, Rushdie says, there's no going back, as he reminds us in another essay about the film, The Wizard of Oz. The truth is, once we've left our childhood spaces, armed only with what we have and are, we understand that the real secret of the ruby slippers is not that there's no place like home, but rather that there's no longer any such place as home, except, of course, for the home we make or the homes that we are made for us in Oz, which is any way and any way except the place from which we began. So in, in, in these essays as well as his writings, he questions the idea of fixed boundaries, of fixed uh, birthplaces, fixed uh, uh, places of origin, or the idea of essentialist nation, national or nations or identities by showing uh, the the reality of movement and how mobility problematizes these essentialist boundaries. Uh, uh, before I move on to the next notion, I would show how uh, Rushdie anticipates the, uh, global, uh, the, the global movement, global era, and that's why he has been appropriated equally in globalization. For instance, some say that two India-born novelists, Salman Rushdie, he's equated with uh, other writers who are called, we talk about Salman Rushdie and his children. And Amitabh Ghosh have been seen the most successful in vividly portraying the lives of people transformed by globalization without explicitly using the word. Since the early 80s, Rushdie and Ghosh have written ambitious novels that give meaning to our globalized world without setting out to do just that. In their fiction, they've honored the individual's survival instinct, cheering his ability to adapt and change his own self. So what I'm saying is that Rushdie's writing opened the floodgates for a lot of writing which followed in its wake by people who are now called Rushdie's children. It be, it, they were begotten, or, or uh, the, the novels which were begotten of Midnight's children, which continue this debate on the interrogation of the nation and the presence of free-flowing movements of people, ideas, things, even in the, in the process as well as in the present. So Rushdie, Ghosh, and globalization, they show the interconnectedness of nations, people, and cultures by interweaving lives. The individual tossed about is real. Rushdie's Bollywood star in the satanic verses literally drops out of the sky when the airplane in which he's traveling gets blown up by terrorists. These individuals hold on to the territory they land on and build their own niches, niches ming mingling with the local culture, often enriching it, and just as often drawing from the culture around them, becoming less of what they were, but not like, quite like the others around them. And now I connect Rushdie to Ghosh. Like Rushdie's migrants in London suburbs are exotic for the locals, but when they transform the city around them, the city doesn't even notice, as in the chapter, a city visible but unseen in the satanic verses. In so doing, Rushdie points out the dangers of multiculturalism. Connecting other worlds, Rushdie has taken his readers to Moorish Spain in the Moor's last sigh, and the enchantress of Florence, Rushdie's character, sometimes influence history, even if inward, invertedly. Think of Salim Sinai in Midnight's Children. So I, I would like to so show, uh, close by showing that Rushdie is the first novelist who not only questions the idea of the nation, but he's also the first novelist which talks about uh, 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 whose novels through the mobility of their protagonist, through their movement between different cities, uh, s different continents, sh uh, point to a, a, a history of globalization which predates the present history of globalization, which is believed to have begun in the late 80s. Uh, and Rushdie shows these connected histories not only uh, with or n not only the colonial histories but also pre-colonial histories where uh, Europe, India, Middle East were connected with one another through tracing the movements of uh, uh, 
uh, protagonist who sets sail from one part of the world to another world, not only from the east to the west, but also from the west to the east, to show the connections between cities as diverse as Florence and Sikri, between New York, London, and Calcutta. So Rushdie is the first novelist who uh, not only quests the idea of glo uh, the nation, but also uh, inaugurates the movement towards globalization, which is carried forward by his uh, successors.